I'm so delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Faculty of Divinity at Cambridge University to this remarkable conference, New Trinitarian Ontologies. The faculty is extremely proud of the graduate student team which has organised this conference on such a global scale, raising funding and putting together such an exciting and in fact field-changing event. If I might first of all introduce you to the organising team, Ryan Hecker at the far end, who first conceived the theological vision of this project, Alex Abbasina, um, Jonathan Lionheart here, and Austin Stevenson, um, who with Ryan have worked together in the most extraordinary fashion to make this moment arrive. Um, and it's quite dazzling um, to see this moment now, now here. Against a backdrop of such utter political desuetude in the UK, <laughs> um, I do not know if the organising team, none of them Europeans, at least by birth, knows quite what a timely event and what a tonic this conference is. But more than that, more than a tonic, perhaps they don't realise how its Trinitarian ontology may present ways forward um, at this time of rivalrous impasse and night horrors. Some of us can't help but see this as a cosmic event, itself a kind of mystical international unproroguing of Parliament. <laughs> and Trinitarian ontology, a new light for us to see our way forwards. But enough of that. I'm going to hand over now to Ryan, who is going to offer a few introductory words about the theme of this conference. Thank you so much. The study of ontology has since resulted in the successive construction of foundational and formal ontologies, which, whether among the heirs of Frege or of Husserl, had constructed the elements of being into a towering structure of being, an ontotheology that could then come to be toppled by the critiques of Ludwig Wittgenstein and Martin Heidegger, as well as the postmoderns. And yet with this collapse, we may once more witness the conditions to renew the study of metaphysics for the study of Christian theology. The study of Trinitarian ontologies can perhaps be called new as we ask new questions in search of new answers to so many of the puzzles of the past. Challenges to Christian doctrine can thus be read to present new possibilities. Such questions have previously been pursued in Germany by Hans Urs von Balthasar, Klaus Himmel, and Ferdinand Ulrich, in Italy by Chiara Lubick, Giulio Maspero, and Piero Coda, and more recently in England by John Milbank, Catherine Pickstock, and Graham Award among the movement known as Radical Orthodoxy. This conference has resulted from the collaborative efforts of a small team of doctoral students in the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. We have wholeheartedly dedicated ourselves this past year for many hundreds of hours to prepare for this momentous event. Our conference planning team includes myself, Alex Abachina, Jonathan Leonhardt, and Austin Stevenson, as well as Sebastian Milbank and Matthew Fell. We've also benefited in innumerable ways from the advice of Catherine Pickstock, as well as the advice of Dr. James Orr. This conference could moreover not have been possible without the generous support of three European universities, including the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge, the Relational Ontologies Research Institute at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, and the St. Nicholas Center for Eastern Churches at the University of Freiburg. We have also benefited greatly from the generous support of six Cambridge colleges, including Peterhouse, Emmanuel, St. John's, Queen's, Magdalen, and St. Edmund's Colleges. We will, for the next three days, convene for four speaker panels and one concluding discussion panel each day for a total of 15 panels. Each panel will consist of three or two 20-minute presentations, followed by 20 or 30 minutes of collaborative discussion. During each of these concluding discussions, we will field questions from the audience with roving microphones. We will have two breaks with coffee, tea, and cookies to be catered on the patio outside at approximately 10.45 a.m. and 3 p.m. each day. 
Later in the afternoon, we'll have over an hour for a lunch break, in which we encourage you to find your own lunch at a local restaurant. Please note that the proceedings of this conference will be filmed and broadcast online in the future. Food and drinks are not allowed in the Babbage Lecture Theater, and due to a liability for allergies, nuts are not allowed in the conference at any time. Finally, fire escapes are located at the top of the steps and behind the stage, as well as toilets and restrooms. With my concluding gesture, I wish to welcome for our opening address one of the very great thinkers of our time, a renowned theologian whose thoughts have exercised an incomparable influence over so many of us here today, and I should say the very spiritual inspiration of this conference, Professor John Milbank. Do I go here? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome everyone from everywhere. Uh, I, I finally worked out where this was. You wouldn't think I'd ever been in Cambridge, but here I am. Um, the Cambridge project on Trinitarian ontology is being launched at a time of an ignorable global political crisis now all too apparent on these shores. In the midst of growing civil tension, one can recall the time of actual British civil war in the 17th century. During this period, the bohemian sage Jan Amos Kamensky, or Comenius, visited this country. Although a reformed Christian ally of the English parliamentary cause, he pursued an ecumenical philosophical and pedagogic project which he dubbed Pan-Sophia. This was rooted in the long-term Catholic legacy and in medieval and Renaissance thought, especially that of Nicholas of Cusa, besides a new embrace of experimental philosophy. What has now become much clearer to scholars is that, that at the heart of pan lay the attempt to articulate a fully Trinitarian ontology. This was profoundly associated in Comenius's mind with an endeavor to secure peace in Europe, to restore the unity of Christendom on a common doctrinal basis, and even to improve relationships with other faiths on the basis of their perceived anticipations of Trinitarian understanding. Simon Kuchelbauer suggests that we can describe Comenius's quest as being one for an integral enlightenment. The enlightenment which eventually triumphed was by contrast Socinian and Arian, as exemplified by Locke and Newton. It not only refused the orthodox trinity, but in a linked manner tended to see the chances of peaceful consensus as deriving from the imposition of a univocal reason, an acceptance only of fully clear ideas and the application everywhere and to everything of a single unified methodical procedure. In consequence, it intensified the neo-scholastic separation of reason from faith and nature from grace. Religion was to be reformed in terms of a fully transparent reason, not reason qualified and elevated by the more obscure glimmerings of historical revelation. By contrast, the upholders of Trinitarian doctrine like Comenius or Edward Stillingfleet in England were often those who also tended to perpetuate against neo-scholasticism and the fideisms of now rival confessions an integral unity of faith and reason. They correspondingly insisted that few of our thoughts are fully clear and that thinking cannot be separated from imaging, speaking, communicating, producing, and associating. They all tended to ascribe to what Rome Williams, with respect to Richard Hooker, has well described as a kind of contemplative pragmatism. For this outlook, the healing of the soul and of society lies more in the direction of a reconciliation of concrete and specific differences that cannot simply be anticipated in advance. The way out of the labyrinth of the world, as Comenius described it, is therefore at once practical, yet also mystical. In terms of this vision, 
Comenius tried to offer a Trinitarian revision of the traditional ontological categories themselves, as they had been ultimately inherited from Plato and Aristotle. One can plausibly connect his endeavor with the famous suggestion made by Bishop Klaus Semele in his long letter to Hans Oss von Balthasar of 1976 that eventually became his thesis for a Trinitarian ontology. This suggestion is that secularization and the decline of Christianity could be due to a kind of forgetting of the Trinity, rather akin to Heidegger's forgetting of being. Indeed, more precisely, to a failure to rethink being as such or ontology insufficiently Christian, which is to say Trinitarian terms. Hamela went on briefly to sketch an ontology in which reciprocal love would be inseparable from our understanding of the analogical structure of reality. It can be argued as to how far Hamela was right to think that there had been a failure to articulate a Trinitarian ontology in the past. Though it might be hard to deny that it has ever been adequately foregrounded. One could also argue as to whether Trinitarian ontology is precisely the right description of this endeavor. It can be misleading, insofar as ontology was born as a term taken to mean a truncating of traditional metaphysics in order to reconceive it as adequately and exhaustively focused upon being, rather than as sustaining, as with Aristotle, a tension between being and God. The danger then is that God will be idolatrously located within a transcendental field of being that logically precedes him. But clearly, that cannot be the mode of ontology that the phrase Trinitarian ontology implies. On the other hand, to speak of a Trinitarian metaphysics risks running foul of the Thomistic sense that metaphysics, as primarily about being, points only remotely towards God, who is more fully disclosed by revelation. And yet it is clear that in articulating this disclosure, Aquinas himself understood it to involve a considerably revisionary sense of the structures of being itself, which he frequently articulated in Trinitarian terms. Thus, the term Trinitarian ontology can be taken to imply just this mode of faith-derived revision, even though one can note that in the past other terms have been resorted to. For example, theosophy in the case of Antonio Rosmini in the 19th century. To articulate a Trinitarian ontology is to revise one's sense of the world in terms of the historical disclosure of the hitherto secret, if perennially half intuited, heart of God in the heart of the world itself through the incarnation. This, as Julia Maspero says, is the third voyage of the Logos, after the first two indicate in Plato's Phaedo, the work of the pre-Socratics and then the work of his pupils Plato and Aristotle and their successes ever since. In the end, the nomenclature does not so much matter, and Trinitarian ontology seems both now standard and appropriate for the reasons just indicated. It can be taken to include three aspects. The imminent ontological structures of God himself, the relationship of God to his creation, and finally, the inner ontological structures of the creation. In terms of the first, as Sarah Coakley has rightly suggested, certain issues go unresolved right up to the present. Is ontological relation thinkable, even as mystery? Why is there a threefold and not just a twofold difference in God? In exactly what way are the Trinitarian persons, as both Augustine and Aquinas indicate, somehow in excess of relation, even though they are exhaustively described by relation? And how is it that there is, in some sense, um, a motion, a kind of derivation in God, although um, this motion from the paternal origin must already assume the later hypostatic termini as co-origins in their own right, as Clemens Calibur argued. In terms of the second issue, how are we to understand the outgoing and return of God to himself in the imminent trinity 
in relation to its inseparability from the outgoing and return of the creation to God. In what, if any sense, does the creation add something to reality and to God, even though it would seem that it cannot do so if God is all in all? In terms of the third issue, Trinitarian revision of the ontological categories variously concerns a heightened place for event, motion, relation, and personhood with respect to an inherited priority of substance. The legitimacy of this revision derives from the incarnation itself. Because the Trinity is disclosed to us within the structures of time and space, we can only remotely grasp the Trinitarian Godhead if we simultaneously seek to deepen our grasp of the finite world we live in. This quest is as much revisionary as it is contemplative, as much mystical as metaphysical, as much an attempt to change reality as to see reality for what it really is, since it can only become what it truly is in relation to God. To see the world as peace and harmony, indifference, is also to transform the world in that direction. It is, again, to cite the great Czech philosopher, to exit the labyrinth for the paradise of the heart. I welcome you all on this British, European, and global journey. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, and uh, now we can start with uh, Professor uh, Giulio Maspero. It is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, him. And uh, Professor Giulio Maspero, he is a professor of dogmatic theology at the Faculty of Theology at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. He is a member of the Pontifical Academy of Theology and of the International Association for Patristic Studies. He is a recognized specialist in Gregory of Nyssa, as uh, it is documented by many works of him, uh, and I just mentioned his uh, Trinity and Men, and Being and Relation, the Trinitarian Ontology of Gregory of Nyssa. The title of his speech is uh, A Trinitarian Ontology, the Relational Approach. Sorry, just one moment to fix everything here. No, this is not the right one. Slide show. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, also, to I'm grateful for this uh, European uh, meeting uh, that maybe show shows how a relational union is possible in Europe and what Europe can do when references are not raised but recognized as, uh, recognized as, as uh, richness. So, uh, my title is somehow mm, misleading because uh, I will not talk about a new Trinitarian ontology, but maybe uh, a rediscovering or a di the discovering on, of the Trinitarian ontology of the fathers of the church. This is the Greek father that I know a little bit, uh, a tad at least. So my talk will um, develop in three steps, Trinitarianly. First of all, the fathers with, with this great idea of mind the gap, I will explain later. Then I will move to Aquinas to get to contemporary th theology and maybe a task that we can develop together. Uh, 
the conclusion would be about the relationship between the Mary's being and the Trinity. So, first of all, um, we are talking about not only the ontology of the Trinity, that was something that I'm sorry for the, mis no, the problem with the formats, but don't worry. We are not going to talk just about the ontology of the Trinity that was uh, a task um, developed by the fathers of the church and by any theologian. You have to, to think about the being of the triune God, but also this is the essential step. We will start to th think about, to, to look at the word from the Trinity. So we, I call TO, Trinitarian Ontology, first of all, the study of the being of the Trinity, and then the step towards creation and how we can reread creation in this light. This is also Piero Coda's approach, and because of that, in uh, Relation and Ontology Research Group in Rome and in Sofia Institute in Lopiano, Florence, we are working together so much. The version, the flavor, the, the sort of uh, Trinitarian ontology that I'm going to present is the relational ontology developed by the fathers of the church in the first century in, in the Greek world from Nicaea to Constantinople. When I started studying that, I get in love with this topic because I think it's, it's really serious stuff. So I need to go through three steps. First of all, in what it consists, this relational ontology, then to prove that this relational ontology is a Trinitarian ontology, and then to show the influence of this version of uh, relational ontology, of Trinitarian ontology from Middle Ages to present time. So when I use the, the word ontology, and John's remark was very useful before, I'm not talking about Heidegger, but uh, I'm talking about a generalized version of metaphysics. So in, in, in ancient Greece, we had a metaphysics, like this, this search of the first principle behind ta physica, nature, cosmic nature. But then, with Christianity and Revelation, we dis discover the importance of, uh, of man, of the person, of freedom, and so we had to develop a new ontology. And most of all, with the uh, Trinitarian Re Revelation, we got a serious problem. So my idea is to th think about ontology in a very wide way, as the fathers did, talking about common notions. So it's something that you can use at the restaurant. No? When you ask for meat and you get fish, this is a metaphysical problem, and everything is based on a metaphysical ju judgment. You know, because when the waiter comes, you have a problem. So um, when I say this in Italy with serious uh, metaphysicians, um, it can become a problem, but I'm, I'm very convinced of this. And also, um, I also speak of uh, a general theolo theology. Every man is a theologian somehow, because you have to decide what's the meaning of your life. This is the theological option. So if you say that in God, in God we trust, and you put it on a dollar, nothing to say about the United States, but against the United States, but this is the theological sentence somehow. So theology is not just developing divinity schools, faculty of theology, but it's something uh, much wider. And it is at the core of the Bible, because when the Jewish people met God, they had to develop a metaphysical judgment. Who is this? What is this? He is the creator. And even um, from a literary point of view, when in Exodus, for example, 16, 16th, uh, 15, in front of the manna, before the manna, um, the Jewish people ask, man who? What is this? A metaphysical question. But in the gospel, the problems get even uh, more difficult because Jesus called this God, who is the creator, not only father, but dead. And in all uh, Indo-European languages, we have two words, two terms to express uh, uh, being the father. The first is pater, and the second is atta. Father comes, comes from pater, and dead comes from atta. Papa, we have many, many versions of it. But pater is essentially different from, uh, from atta, because pater can be God, so with a um, infinite difference in ontology. Zeus, the first of the, of the gods, a god in general, a f the founder of a, of a state, of a country, the founder of a, a company, a politician who started a, a movement, uh, a tribal chief, uh, the ancestor. So father is not related to an identity of nature. You cannot call dead 
uh, Bill Gates, if you're not his or her, um, his or daughter or sons or children. But we can call God dead because Christ did that. And so in Christ, uh, the father was called dead. And this is a, a, a metaphysical conundrum because he's talking about being the, of the same uh, nature with the one who is essentially different in nature. So this is <laughs> where everything started. The first step because of this is to understand how the father had to reshape the ontological view of the world. And I, th and I speak of ontology because the first um, image on the left is metaphysics where we have just one ontological level, both finite and eternal. So we have these two worldly and divine attributes because the world itself was eternal and God himself was finite or itself, better said. Then with the fathers, we moved to a different picture where we have two different ontological levels. The first one is the Trinity, God, where eternal becomes a really divine attribute. On the contrary, the world become finite and essentially different from, uh, from God. So we have here the beginning of uh, the Trinitarian ontological issue question because we have to recognize a gap between an, an infinite gap between God and the world. And every theory about the world, about God, has to take into account this gap. So has to give an answer about how these two um, ontological levels are related. This is Trini Trinitarian ontology. Uh, you cannot, can be against Trinitarian ontology, but you have to do Trinitarian ontology. If you're doing metaphysics, if you're doing theology, because you have to answer the, answer the question. And it's very interesting to see how the idea of the first principle, of the first level that you have, is reflected on the second level. And what I'm trying to explain is how the fathers, the Greek fathers of the church, developed a relational view of the first level, and because of that started a movement that we can uh, develop to read the world in a relational way. And very interesting things happen when we, we do this. So, um, the first attempt on, on the side of the father was with Justin, who was a, a philosopher and became a Christian and because of that a theologian in a technical way. Uh, he started thinking of the difference between the father and the son in terms of logos. So the, the son is the thought of the fathers, the thought with, whom, with which uh, the father created the world. What happens here is that there is a, a, a spiritual a difference between the Father and the Logos, but at the same time, the Logos is related to creation. So somehow the world is the cause of the Logos, not just the Father. So there is a too strict connection, too narrow connection between uh, the Father and the world, or God and the world. Uh, the Logos is in, in between, in a platonic way. He's a kind of mediator on this chair, of this ladder that connects the world with, uh, with God. So it cannot be fully recognized as God. On the contrary, in the first century, Athanasius started it, but the Cappadocian developed it. Logos was moved from between, in between the gap, into, within the, the first principle, the, the Arche. And this, is, was, this was the uh, orthodox version of Trinitarian ontology that we inherited and that started all what we are doing here. But the path from these two extremes was not so safe and easy because, for example, Origen had to develop after Justin a new version of, uh, of the Trinitarian ontology that could cope with the differences within God. And because of that, he identified the only spiritual level of reality with the Trinity, where the differences between the, true, two, the three divine persons were understood in terms of participation because he had had the possibility to have recourse to different um, relational the, um, tools as we as the Cappadocian uh, did later. So, in um, in origin, we have the, the gap, a clear gap, an infinite gap, but at the same time, within the Trinity, the differences uh, between the person 
are expressed in a non-perfect way from the, uh, the later perspective. Why we say that that manner wasn't perfect? Because he paved, it paved the way to Arius. Because you had some, something of a ladder between Trini the Trinity and uh, the world. You had somehow a ladder within God himself. And so the Arians started reading, uh, as far as we know, uh, we can reconstruct from our perspective. This ladder was moved from within God into the gap itself. So somehow mm, the Arians went back to a perspective where there is no gap, or the gap is somehow a gray zone between God and, and the world. This, is, this was the, the real problem, and we know how much it influenced uh, theology. But <clears throat> what we have here is that uh, the Trinitarian version of uh, the, ont the Trinitarian ontology of the Fathers comes from uh, Scripture itself. What I'm trying to show here, moving to Middle Age, is that this Trinitarian ontology, this relational ontology, because the tricks, the trick used by the Father to express the differences between the divine person, was that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit can be distinguished only through relation or origin, um, relational, relations of origin between them. So relations was moved from the accidental um, real into the substance, is divine substance itself. So this is something completely new. According to Porphyry, the first principle should be uh, without any relations because relation means uh, something weak from ontological point of view. On the contrary, the Logos was reread from the perspective of the Cappadocians as a pure relation within the divine substance. So there is an immanence in the divine substance that is inhabited by this person who are distinguished just because of their relations. And this comes from the prologue. So my idea, my reading is that what the fathers of the church did comes from the prologue of John. Piero Codas wrote that uh, all the Trinitarian theology of the first century could be re read as a discussion of the prologue of John. In the prologue of the first uh, gospel, we see a wonderful chiastic structure, he, like the Greek letter he. We, have the, we can see how the beginning, the, the first part of the, of the prologue, uh, does correspond to the second part. It's like going from within God to the word, incarnation, the gift, the immense gift of divine filiation that is given to those who believe in Jesus, and then back. So we can trace the way back from the history of salvation to the Trinity. What is wonderful is that the beginning of the prologue and the last part of the prologue do correspond to each other. And we see how the word, the logos, is read as the Son, the only Son of God. The beginning is read as the Father. And so on, we can see how there is a correspondence that is pointed in this pointing at the same time towards the Jewish tradition in the beginning with our articles in Greek, uh, points to Bereshit, the beginning of Genesis, as we know. Uh, Logos is pointing to Dabar but also to the Greek tradition, the philosophic tradition somehow, because Arche and Logos were key words in the mm, philosophical uh, developments, developments. But here we can read also um, relations somehow, because uh, the Logos was pros ton theon, and pros ton theon points to pros di, that is just relation according to Aristotle. So we have also a Greek um, or we can read there a Greek element, uh, another Greek and metaphysical element that is reshaped, um, reread by the fathers, that is pre present in an obvious way in, um, um, in, in the Jewish tradition because of the covenant, because God is the God of Abraham, not just of mountains and seas, but is God of the fathers, of persons. So everything is relational in the, in the Old Testament. But in this way, we get that through scripture, we can see how um, ratio, what we call reason, logos, is reread in a relational way. And even in Aquinas, we can find a, 
a kind of apophatism, an apophatic element. So we can see how, according to Aquinas, we cannot get to know the substance of God. Even more, we cannot, do, we cannot um, express um, the logos, uh, sorry, God himself as logos. This is very technical, you have it in the article. But Logos was read by Aquinas in the last part of his life, not as an essential attribu attribute, but just as a notional attribute. And in this way, the, the limits of reason can be read as windows. So our reason, when touches the, the limitations, the borders, can discover that those borders are the place of relations, or are the place where you can discover new richness. And because of that, a clear example, in my view, of what happened with Aquinas is that he developed a new um, definition of persons. The first attempt was by Boetius, as we know, uh, using the term substance that wasn't good for God, because in this way, the three divine persons should, be, should become three substances. Because of that, um, Richard of St. Victor's in the Middle Age reworked the definition of person and proposed another one based on the word existence, existentia. That is very good for God, so Richard mm, does very well with God, but the problem is that this definition isn't fit, uh, isn't good for the world. Because of that, Aquinas developed a new definition as subsistence in rationale natura, where the idea of a subsistence is perfect because it can be applied both to divine persons within the divine substance and to the world. And this is just Trinitarian ontology because you are, you are developing a theology that can be effective both to express the being of God and the being of the world. So because of that, in my reading, um, Aquinas develops a Trinitarian ontology defining the divine person as relative subsistence. And we in the contemporary um, world, we find in modern theology, we find, for example, Antonio Rosmini, already um, quoted, who extends this uh, definition also to the human being. This is maybe difficult. I don't share the view or completely share the view, but it is clear that there is an attempt. Those modern theologians, I skip this slide, who developed more uh, a thought related to Trinitarian ontology were Balthasar and Danielou. Jean Danielou, uh, explicitly um, spoke of Trinitarian ontology. And their idea was to answer to existentialism and to read the existential dimension of the human person in, from the perspective of the Trinity. This sentence by Balthasar is very clear. And both of them developed a theology of history and started something related to theology of the body. In my perspective, History is time plus relations, and body is matter plus relations. So every th Trinitarian ontology implies that we have to develop a theology of history and a theology of the body. This is something very important now. My conclusion is with Mary, because when we think about uh, the being of Mary, it's, everything is related to being the mother of God and also to being somehow within the Trinity. So she has the logos within herself, and in the end, she is within the Trinity. And in her, we can see maybe which, which is the real ontology of the human being in the light of the Trinity. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Giulio Maspero. And now we should uh, have uh, had uh, Professor Piero Coda. But uh, as you can uh, imagine, uh, he's not here. Uh, because of uh, an unexpected uh, duty in uh, Italy, uh, he could not come here.
but uh, uh, there is uh, a post-doc uh, uh, research fellow of uh, Dr. Maria Benedetta Curi coming from Florence. And I will say just a few words uh, of presentation about uh, Professor Piero Coda, and then uh, uh, Maria Benedetta will uh, uh, read the paper of uh, Professor Coda. Uh, Piero Coda is a professor of Trinitarian Ontology and dean of the Sofia University Institute in Florence. He is a member of the Pontifical Academy of Theology and of the International Theological Commission. He is currently the director of an international project meant to set up a dictionary of Trinitarian ontology. He has extensively published in the field of Trinitarian ontology, and I just mentioned, from the Trinity, God between history and prophecy. And uh, then some few words uh, of presentation about uh, Maria Benedetta, who is a research fellow in Trinitarian ontology at the Sofia University Institute in Florence and collaborates with Professor Piero Coda. She has published mainly on Klaus Hemmerle and uh, Franz Rosenzweig. And the title of Professor Piero Coda, which will be read by Maria Benedetta Curi, is Trinitarian ontology, a way to rethink thinking. Okay. Um, Piero Cola is sorry he can't be here today. He sent his greetings and I hope I can express his thought well. I try. This paper offers a brief way to rethink ontology in terms of a Trinitarian ontology in four steps according to the perspective of research promoted by the Sofia University Institute in Loppiano, near Florence, Italy. We want to explore this way together now. Certainly, it is not an exhaustive path, but a map for a first orientation. This path is inspired by the Manifesto for a Trinitarian Ontology, a short and daring text already published in Italian in the scientific journal of our institute and translated into other languages, English, English, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese. Written five years ago by Piero Coda and reviewed in Italy by a team of theologians such as Giulio Maspero and Lubo Mirzak and philosophers such as Mauro Mantovani, Massimo Donà and Massimiliano Marianelli, this relational and dynamic text we can say performative, is now accompanied by an apparatus of glosse, as in ancient times in the margin of the text, which I have compiled and continue to update thanks to the dialogues in class with students of Trinitarian Ontology course that I could teach with Professor Coda for the philosophical part. Let's start now. Step one, the challenge and the kairos. Edgar Morin writes that today there is an urgent need to rethink thinking. Indeed, it is possible to recognize from multiple fronts, theological as well as philosophical, a profound convergence in the prophecy of a new thought or form of thinking as the understanding and practice of an integral and open ontology that expresses and promotes the living mystery of being in its multicultural self-expressions. Such thinking that has rich and dwells in the hospitable region of such an ontology and its liberating though demanding ethos calls for a rereading of the traditional thought which has matured through history leading to this point. With its gains and drift, the indispensable paths traced by it and the unexplored question and horizon of sense could now prove to be opportune and meaningful. Step two the inventio and the promise. In this perspective, we can see how a crucial junction was historically produced in the West, which now resonates with a universal significance. It is the encounter between the Greek philosophy on the one hand, which also expresses ancient wisdom from the East, and on the other hand, the understanding of revelation from the biblical Christian experience, which occurred in the golden age of the patristic period and in the Middle Ages. 
In the discovery and the cinema the, of the truth, the most theoretically and practical significant fruit from this encounter was produced in the civil light of God's work by the invention of the ontological regula regulating concept of God Trinity as the interpretative key for the coming in human flesh of the Word or Son, who is God himself in the Holy Spirit, who is also God. It is a concept which is intrinsically in excess by its nature because it is called to find the measureless measure of its truth again and again from within the reality it is called to express. The invention of this concept was historically determined from within the thought formed by a Greek philosophical paradigm by taking up the challenge inherent in the progressive discovery of the singular, unprecedented theoretical significant represented by the eschatological event of the Word of God, the Logos, becoming flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. This Word is precisely God himself, the one through whom everything came to be what it is. This eschatological event of kenosis unfolded in time to the abyss of the abandonment lived out of love by Christ on the cross as the new creations Alpha and Omega freely recapitulating the history of being. For all intents and purposes, the concept of the Trinity was advancing this way throughout the history of thought, inclusively, not exclusively, invitingly, not imposingly, as the decisive horizon framework for the interpretation of the meaning of being, both with reference to God, the infinite being that, coming out of the silence of his abyss, expresses himself in his work, in his work, which is inhabited by a real otherness in the gratuitous, reciprocal, reciprocating relationship of freedom and communication in which everything is said and given in himself and behind himself as agape, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And with reference to creation and to the human being as creation speak and guardian, the human being as a finite being capable of the infinite, precisely because he, she was wanted and placed out of love in being and called in love to recognize and participate in his, her own way, really to the point of unspeakable fullness in the beauty, truth, and goodness of God the Trinity. This implies an unprecedented form of the unity of differences in which the finite is transfigured in a Trinitarian way into the infinite, tapping into its original and ultimate vocation in this way, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us. See in the Gospel of John 17, 21. However, in the history of this encounter, the concept of Trinity failed to completely generate, even within theology, the place, the locus, of experience and the relational communitarian practice of thought that corresponds to the reality he had received and conceived. This is the promise and the kairos, the opportunity for us today. Thus, a lacerating and ultimately unsolvable dialectic was produced in modernity where the way of philosophy, reason, and that of theology, faith, diverged to the point of abstractly opposing one another. Nonetheless, the experience and understanding of the Trinity continued to shine out as source of light and life in some of the mystics, such as Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Ignatius of, Lo of Loyola in the West, and Sergius of Radunesh and Serafim of Sarov in the East. Unfortunately, it did not effectively impact the growing demand for a form of thought and practice in the advanced fields of philosophy, theology, and science. In this way, with insight resulting from the radical hermeneutical suspicion toward any presupposition given at absolute, philosophical thought, as well as that of the humanities and the social sciences, proceeded more or less with awareness into the dark night of nihilism, ending up by increasingly handing over thought and freedom to the impersonal logic of technocracy and post-humanism. Step three, the subject, the object, the locus. 
Our working hypothesis is that philosophy and theology can find a place again for a rebirth and reconfiguration of ontology starting from this point in the guiding thought of Trinity, taken up in its original irradiating meaning with the focus on the cross resurrection of Christ and examined in the unexplored promise it contains. Trinitarian ontology is thus qualified to recognize and to express the Trinitarian sense of being in a Trinitarian way, welcoming its gift in the shared responsibility of Trinitizing it in the multiplicity of expression it takes on and the links it offers within the range of types of knowledge. Chiara Lubick speaks about a Trinitization. This is why the reference to the Trinity simultaneously expresses a meaning which is subjective, objective, and topological. Reference to the subject emphasizes that in the Trinitarian ontology, the thinking I exercises thought in dialogue with the you in the open experience of the we, where he, she, fully and freely becomes themselves becomes themselves, this I and not someone else. In reference to the object, Trinitarian ontology focuses on being as its object, which is illuminated and thoroughly examined in the Trinitarian grammar that characterizes it and gives rhythm to its dynamic and free manifold relations. Reference to the locus emphasizes that Trinitarian ontology is given and expressed within the space time which fosters the disclosure of the meaning of being to those who exercise a dialogue of thought in communion. Inspiration and direction is provided for this ambitious pro project by the existential and intellectual contribution of Klaus Hammerle, Hammerle an avant-garde German thinker between philosophy and theology, as well as by other authors in the late 1900s and in Italy already in the 1800s um, with Antonio Rosmini. Step four, Methodos and Via Marie. From the methodological standpoint, the project is derived from the invitation to enter into the practice and the dialogical itinerary itinerary of thinking in the rhythm of the vital experience of a Trinitarian ontology. In fact, it is a matter of a vague Gemeinschaft, as Klaus Hammerle says, and that is a journey in community and a community on a journey. It is possible to draw up a preliminary map for the experiential exploration of the locus within which the various lines of thought can express themselves. Some indication describes the coordinates of this map. Rather than asking what, TST, literally what is it, in reference to the objects of thought, the question posed is how, wie geht das auf Deutsch, Klaus Hemmerle? Literally, how does it go? So, how does it happen that the true illuminating and substantiating this object is expressed and given? So, the intention of inquiry is expressed in the gift and, the, and in the acceptance that culminate in giving thanks to the other, to the other person and God first of all. Denken is verdanken, Hemmerle. Literally, thinking is thanking, thanking, because, I quote from Hemmerle, seeing only comes about in the image that is given at, this, at the same time as the comprehension that receives, a coinciding in time which is not compromised but a unique new reality of seeing. The dialogical relationship originating in this way the inquiry, in as much as it is cared for and constantly reactivated, fosters the exchange of each with the other in an experience of reciprocity as an asymmetrical event unfolding upward and in depth in a spiral, spiral movement. The word of such dialogue is logos pneumaticos, literally spirit-bearing word according to the Apostle Paul's expression in 1 Corinthians a word which overflows with the Holy Spirit, a word said in the breath of the Holy Spirit. 
The dialogue thus becomes a relational event of the self-given expression of the meaning of the whole truth. When the Logos is offered in the spirit as communication of that wisdom which is beyond the word of the one who is speaking. When this gift of self in reciprocal dialogue is mutual, the word culminates in the silence of love. Some mystics describe this as the kiss of consumed love, the Holy Spirit. This involves the fruitful experience of the negative in any form. This happens when the negative is recognized and given a name so that it can be shared in communicating one's own perspective, one's own limitation, wound, feeling checkmated or entrapped. And all this is in the free stripping away of oneself out of love, where each can rediscover and welcome the gift that the other is and find oneself anew, together with the other, in the beyond fostered by their encounter. The dialogue in mutual love and freedom is thus put into practice each time as perichoresis. This is where thinking with the other aspires to be fulfilled in thinking in one another, in the nous Christu, the mind of Christ, Christ's thought. See 1 Corinthians. This means being proleptically harmonized with the living overflowing rhythm of the, of the Trinitarian perichoresis as the eschatological destiny telos of thought. This way of journeying intentionally and thus ontologically together is a via Marie, the mother and model of a transparent, generating, communitarian form of theoretical, theoria and ethos, experience of wisdom, which allows for the truth to be understood, lived and communicated today. In conclusion, the itinerary presented here, expressed through the manifesto, is what we experience together and put into practice in our research in the locus of the Sofia University Institute. In the dialogue between theology and philosophy, the other sciences, religions, and cultures, together with other scholars and educational institutions. More specifically, specifically, with some of these scholars, we have been working on a project for a Trinitarian ontology dictionary to show how this approach and method can shed light on the various questions, topics, and authors in the history of thought. Thank you. And then we have uh, the last speaker of uh, the first uh, session, who is uh, Professor John Milbank. It is a great pleasure for me to very briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor Milbank, who is a emeritus professor at the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Nottingham, universally acknowledged as the founder of a new perspective in theology known as uh, Radical Orthodoxy, he has significantly contributed to the research on the relation between the theology and the social sciences. And he will speak about uh, most intelligence, uh, time relation, and apuria in Trinitarian ontology. so that we can talk about these um, propositions. Um, sorry, let me hold this. Let me not let you in. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, that's better. Uh, louder and clearer, I hope. Um, the first thing I'm trying to do is to suggest that Augustine in the De Trinitate is offering 
or on the way to offering a kind of full-scale Trinitarian ontology, including a new account of the structures of being in this world. Um, and th th that is very much to do um, with a primacy of time, a primacy of motion, a primacy of the events. And then I, I'm trying to radicalize Augustine by reading him through Bagson and Whitehead. So I'm trying to push his thinking in a more um, vitalistic, a more mutable, um, perhaps slightly panpsychic direction. But at the same time, I'm trying to render the thought of Bergson uh, and Whitehead um, more compatible um, with Christian orthodoxy. That's the first thing I'm trying to do. The second thing I'm trying to do is to pick up on the thought of Antonio Rosmini, which remarkably concurs with the approach of the early Sergei Bulgakov, namely to suggest that the real key to a Trinitarian ontology is the primacy of the theory of the grammatical proposition. Um, and again, I then try to link that with Whitehead's understanding of the proposition. In the um, third place, I try to insist that a Trinitarian ontology really points towards the radically aporetic structures um, of this world, such that not only is the world relational, uh, moving, um, focused on the person, but also none of these things are comprehensible. They all of them defeat the law of non-contradiction, both in terms of God and in terms of our relationship to God. So all these categories radically break down. They can't be understood. They can only be felt. So again, linking up to Whitehead and to a lot of other people, I'm arguing that a Trinitarian ontology points towards a primacy of feeling over thought and suggests that even in God, um, he doesn't really understand himself, he only feels himself um, in order to know. So these are radical theses. And then the fourth thesis um, is that you can only complete a Trinitarian ontology um, with a Christological ontology. So in relation to Augustine, what I'm above all trying to resist, and I'm building on the work of Rowan Williams and Lewis Ayres here, is the idea that, first of all, you have the revelation of the Trinity, then you work out from that to a doctrine of the Trinity in God, and then you dream up a few fancy analogies to God, um, which would constitute um, a kind of Trinitarian ontology of this world. To the contrary, I think the enterprise of an, uh, an imminent Trinitarian ontology of this world is completely integral to what Augustine is doing from the start, and that he only deals with revelation in terms of that kind of Trinitarian ontology. So that, in essence, the Augustinian focus on grace um, involves a kind of radicalization of a sense of inherence of our relationship to God. It's not a movement towards extrinsicism as compared to Greek theosis, but the complete opposite. It's much more saying we can't jump out of time, we can't jump out of the city, we can't jump out of our bodies, we can't jump out of the soul. God has to descend into us. Therefore, the whole of the Trinity for Augustine is, never mind the, the incarnation itself, is only disclosed in the movement of time. The Father is a sounding voice. Um, the, the Son responds to that voice. The, the Spirit descends on the Son. And this is all conveyed in terms of images and metaphors and a sequence of historical arrivals that Augustine is then reflecting on when he comes to his famous categories of memory, understanding, uh, uh, and will. These are not a sort of add-on. They're inherently related to how he thinks we know about the Trinity at all. In other words, Augustine thinks that we can only explore, as it were, the interiority of God, this theosophy, if you like, by um, changing how we understand the internal structures of the world. Um, 
and, and helping even to transform the world as we re-understand those structures. And above all, this shift has to do with the primacy of time. So in the Confessions, Augustine makes it very clear that creation happens through the speaking of the word in God, the verbum. Throughout Augustine's fault, there's this constant concern with a kind of uttering forth of a sequence, whether this is linguistic, mathematical, or, or musical. That's the constant trope of all his thought, I think. So that it's in that utterance of the logos that the creation comes to be for um, Augustine. And of course, that includes the return of creation to God um, through the, 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 the Holy Spirit. And this means then that there's an inherent link between creation and uh, ex nihilo and coming to be in time. Creation ex nihilo is not a sort of one-off event at the beginning, it's creatio continuo, it's constantly occurring. It's because things, creation is from nothing, that things constantly come to be and then pass away. There is a primacy of time, which Augustine variously thinks of in terms of music, of numbering, uh, uh, and, and, and language. And ultimately, this coming to be and passing away is a continuous cosmic praise. Um, it is a continuous cosmic liturgy. Now, I'm suggesting that we radicalize that by arguing that if um, down to the very bottom, the realities of this world are created, if they are through and through created, if they are in themselves nothing, then they, because paradoxically, they are entirely created by God, it follows that their only being in themselves is their creating of themselves, because they can't receive anything from God, save that capacity to create themselves. It's an extreme paradox. And this is where one can move through the perspectives of somebody like Nicholas of Cusa into the perspectives of people like Bergson and Whitehead and suggest that sort of latent in this Augustinian legacy is this sense that creativity is the primary ontological category. But obviously, try to read that in orthodox terms in terms of kind of a participation of the self-creation of thing, everything that exists in finite reality in the creative act of God. But to understand that as also a participation in the eternal um, generation of the Logos, because as I've already said, those two things for Augustine are inseparable. And now building indeed on the word of Piero Coda and Klaus Vermeerle and von Balthasar and so on, one could also suggest that just as creation is out of nothing, there is a kind of nothingness in the Trinity, not in a Hegelian sense of an identity of nothingness with being, but in the sense of um, Plato in the Sophist, that nothingness is, the is not is always linked to difference. So that even if the persons are substantive relations, there's always an is not linked to their difference. There's a kind of crossing of an abyss that can become a terrible abyss in the event of the, the cross and the incarnation and so forth. Therefore, this constant self-creation, if you like, um, but through a participation in the divine creation out of nothing is also a participation in that bridge over nothingness um, that, that exists in God himself. And then I think we need to read Augustine realistically about time. I don't think it's a psychological, idealist, or phenomenological theory of time he's offering, because he's quite clear that time remains the measure of motion. So that I think that when he talks about the image of God in memory, understanding, and will, He's clear that although that's at an acme in human beings, to some extent this is constitutive of every reality. Every reality only exists by memory arising, responding to what previously is there, and then by anticipating what is to come. And then that strongly links with triadic structures in, in Whitehead's thought um, and the idea that everything only exists by prehending, but then creatively appropriating what preceded it, and then anticipating what is to come. And obviously, this involves a radical refusal of the idea 
that all causality is efficient or even that efficient causality ever makes sense. An effect is always in excess of its cause, just as in, in a way the son is in the excess of the father even though he's equal to the father. And it's at this point that Whitehead talks about everything being propositional. Not only are our theories propositions, everything in reality is in a way a proposition about what precedes it. But this isn't a representative judgment. It's as Gilles Deleuze would say, a kind of proposal. It's as Whitehead puts it, a lure for feeling. Every time we make a sort of theoretical response, or as Rowan Williams put it, a poetic addition to what comes before, we're sort of setting forth a kind of atmosphere. And it's only by sort of a, 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 a feeling that this is appropriate, that our suggestions are appropriate, that we come to any kind of personhood, or that any reality comes to be at all. And because an effect is in excess over cause, um, there's a sense in which nothing prior explains what comes later. So for Whitehead, as for Plato, um, things only emerge because they descend from above, because there is a participation in, in something um, from above. So the, these are very radical suggestions. And I think in that notion of the proposition as a kind of allure for feeling, one has an image of the relationship between uh, the Son or the Logos and the Holy Spirit. Now, Antonio Rosmini suggests, if you ask yourself, what is it that a Trinitarian ontology adds to the theory of the categories or to the theory of the transcendentals? Well, it's the quite simple idea that if you predicate the 10 categories of being, or if you predicate the n number of transcendentals of being, then prior to that predication is the act of predication. There is the saying of being, um, there's, there's the ascribing of something to being. So this implies a kind of predicative act. Um, uh, and if we don't see that as pure necessity, then this seems to involve in some sense the subject. So this is why Rosmini suggests that the prior um, ontological um, notion is that of subject, object, and love, because the expression of the subject in the object, um, uh, the expression of association of desire, is then inevitably a kind of love. And a rather similar thing is articulated by Sergius Bulgakov in his early writings, and then obviously one can link that to the idea of the, the father generating um, the, the, the word in the Trinity and so on. And so you have this kind of fundamental grammatical slash ontological model. Given that it seems to be clear that any theory of being, any theory of the categories of any kind is at once grammatical and ontological. It is, as Aristotle says, what is said of being. And at this point, one has a kind of third way in philosophy. It's not a kind of pre-modern theory of the subject, but it's not a modern epistemological theory of the, the subject. It's something much more like a metaphysical theory of the, the, the subject. And there's a sense in which, ever since Socrates, that has been latent for the West, just as because the West has always refused atomism, monism, or the pure flux, there's a sense of relation in the sense of attachment has always been primary, just as Aristotle refuses to say that motion is nothing, and then Plotinus makes motion much more important, and he's followed by the Greek fathers in this respect. Even thought is kinetic. You can predicate even kinesis of God. So it's not so much, I think, that Trinitarian ontology is an absolute rupture in the history of, of the West, but that it perfects these tendencies of the, of the West already to allow the linking reality of relation as connection and motion and, and so on. It brings it to a kind of fulfillment. But then I'm also wanting to suggest, and perhaps very controversially, that you can't make sense of any of these things. This is where, as I said, I think Sarah Coakley is right to raise these issues that relation, real relation, it does seem that everything is connected. But as the great Victorian 
British philosopher H.F.H. H. F. H. Bradley said, as soon as you have the idea of a connection, you have to ask, well, what is the third thing making the linkage? And then you're in an infinite regress. It's a mystery. Similarly, if you think of a relation as purely belonging to something, it vanishes back into that thing. Or if you think of it as purely external, it vanishes into a pure externality. And yet we know that relation is the most real thing of all. So I'm suggesting that if reality echoes the mystery of the Trinity, reality itself, as for Gregory of Nyssa, is fundamentally mysterious. We can't make sense of relation anyway. We can't make sense of motion anyway, as we've known since Zeno. Motion divides up into an infinitesimal series of actions and passivities unless we see motion as one indivisible act. But we can't really think that. We can only feel it. So if one is not to be led into a kind of abyss, if one isn't to go into the direction of a certain kind of Buddhism of seeing everything as empty because it's all aporetic. And even the thing itself doesn't make sense because a thing surrounds itself and therefore is outside itself. It's once inside itself and outside itself, which I think is all articulated in relation to the persons of the Trinity. So even the idea of a thing doesn't really make sense. But the way we avoid that sense of emptiness is to say that we think, we feel, we enact, that somehow the world doesn't conform to logic. <laughs> it, it opens itself up to feeling. <laughs> um, um, you know, and, and, and therefore Bergson is, in essence, despite the way you have to modify him, he's right. It's when we feel, it's when we make works of art, that we're literally in touch with the deepest real processes of self-shaping creation that science can never actually discover. It's when we're in resonance with those things that reality opens up for us. And this is why people like Julio Maspero or Piero Coda or Klaus Meller are quite right to say that the Trinitarian ontology is in the end proclaiming the absolute priority of love. It's saying that love is the real thought, if you like. So this is just a slightly confused summary, but the, the final thing that I, I want to say is about Christology, because I think if you follow through on this very anti-Kantian idea that you can take from Leibniz or from Whitehead, that we're never in a kind of closed circle of the knower and the known. Where, you know, uh, uh, Whitehead denied what he called the bifurcation of nature. So he said that our thoughts, our feelings are just as much part of the real as, as the things we see outside us. We're in, we're in a series. Now, if we're in a series, that means every time we have a thought, um, we're having to theorize about the whole. We're having to do, as somebody I think has already said, a kind of informal metaphysics all the time, exactly, even when, it, when we're in the restaurant. We're making a kind of theory about the whole of reality because things are in an infinite series. And this is why Kant is wrong, why even somebody like Wittgenstein is too transcendentalist, where somebody like Whitehead sees that it's that hermeneutic process itself that leaves you out into a sort of rough mode of speculative metaphysics. So it's, it's rather as Leibniz says, that every new reality, every new monad, is a kind of theory about the whole and all that has preceded it. Every time we make a theory, make a proposal, feel about it, live it through, um, we're only thinking reality by adding to reality. But then, of course, you supposing we're wrong, <laughs> you know, that goes on forever. And this is, I think, is where Christology comes in. The, the Christians posit an end to speculation. Christ is the final speculation. Christ is the final monad. We think that however far we add to reality, we're still only thinking also about Christ alongside the cosmos. We're not exiting the, the, the church. We're adding to what Aquinas called the totus Christi. And that's our Trinitarian ontology. Thank you. Thank you.
questions. So you just need to raise your hand and uh, my colleagues will uh, reach with the microphones. Over there. Okay, so I have a brief question for Professor Maspero. Looking at your four diagrams, that's just in the Cappadocians' origin and areas, it's, the structure here, here seems remarkably reminiscent of traditional philosophical problems around substance dualism. If you, here, you, when you're dealing with substance dualism, you need to make a trade-off between two things. You need to keep your domains distinct, and you need to allow interaction between them. And normally, one comes at the cost of the other. Hence, um, in Justin, we have um, a logos, a third thing, that declares the job done by fiat. Perhaps not satisfactory. Then we have our two ladder structures. The, the risk we run, I suppose, is that if we allow too much connection, then we lose the distinctness of the divine and profane. And if we preserve the domain, the difference too rigorously, we'll never get our interaction. Now, you've, you place the, trinities, the trinity as a kind of ladder. In the, in the first instance, as reaching down um, from God towards the world, and then the second in Arius as a kind of ascension from the world towards God. The way I understood your eventual conclusion was that these two ladders could in the end be shown to be the same. I think, was that the thrust of the move with John? So that then we get a virtuous cycle going. Each, each creates the, co-creates the other. My question is, how does one enter the virtuous circle? Virtuous circles are fine, but you can't declare them by fiat from the beginning. There has to be a, a way into the circle. Thanks for, for the question. The point is that we can have two kinds of circle. The Greek circle, met metaphysical circle, where everything is already set. For example, in Plato, you have just to, to recall reality. So there is no real novelty. On the contrary, you can have a, a Christian circle <laughs> where the circle is relational. So it's just at the core of what John has just said. The third is the key to everything. When you have something in between, for example, with the gap, you have a strong difference between, absolute difference between God and the world. That, that could be read as, okay, so we are far. <laughs> but it's not the contrary. Because that means that what you have between God and the, and the world is a relation. So it's something that unites and keeps the difference at the same time. So when we get friends, uh, there is something between us somehow. Love is not just a matter of, uh, of feelings, not in the Bergsonian sense, but uh, in uh, the postmodern sense. It's not just imagination, mm. but it's something real that happens and stays in, uh, in our life. So what we have through incarnation is that the son became man, filling the gap not through the gap, <laughs> but from within to within. So it's just like... Sorry, the tube, sorry for the, but in the tube you hear, mind the gap. So I, when I'm the tube in London, I always think about, oh, this is very deep. <laughs> and people look at me, are you crazy? Yeah, but I'm thinking about the Cappadocians. <laughs> but it's, it's connected somehow. <laughs> so you, you go th through, from within the Trinity to within the human being, and because of that, the, the, the world. Also, the reference to Mary was my Christological way of ending the, mm -hmm the paper, is related to, to this, because the sun is within Mary. <laughs> so this is something, but this means that Mary is within the Trinity. <laughs> Somehow, this is, this is, is a relation. There is no confusion. So you, you still have the gap. The gap is always there. So the circle is real, because in Plato, it's, it isn't a real circle. Everything is already set. It's formal. It's like in the sto Stoicians, so... Everything is logical. Mm -hmm. But on the contrary, if you go to reality, you have paradoxes, you have... Mm -hmm. I studied physics before. I, I, did, I did chaos theory, and I know very well Gödel. And so logic is incomplete. And we can find that in the Cappadocians. We can find that in theology. So we are much closer to uh, science, serious science, that, that we think. 
this is my reading. I'm sorry for, <laughs> I'm passionate Italian, you know, but beg your pardon. <laughs> Thanks for a good question. Over there. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I have a question, not so much a question, but I just wanted to bring, bring a topic up, which uh, uh, John Milbank, which uh, you had mentioned, you had you used the word panpsychism, mm. which kind of intrigued me. And I wonder whether this is, this is where we find that, that, that issue coming up. You, you talked about uh, Augustine and the notion of the idea that we, we, we shouldn't over-psychologize the reading of Augustine, but really think of it ontologically, and that therefore, the temporal mm -hmm. is essential to creation. To be mm -hmm. is to participate in the temporal in that way. Um, and then, toward the end of your discussion, you talk about how, um, how the thing, the object, is not ever comprehensible, that it constantly mm -hmm. escapes, and that what we really end up with in that, in that infinite regress mm -hmm. is the world of feeling. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is where the, the real being of things, in a sense, comes out through feeling. When you put those two things together, in a sense, then to be is to feel in this sense. And I, and I just wanted to ask whether this is where the idea of panpsychism emerges and what you're suggesting. Um, yes, I, th I think that's right. I mean, I, I didn't necessarily mean um, a literal form of panpsychism, but I think it seems to be perfectly compatible with Augustine to say that he thinks it's this sort of look inside yourself, which is also a, a looking at your relations, um, you know, is the best key to reality. It's a bit like later on people like Goethe or Maine de Biron will say, that because we're within side nature, it's not that we know nature by looking at it, but that we seriously know, it, you know, our internality might be something like the inside of a tree or a stone, et cetera, et cetera. Not that these things are necessarily conscious, but that there's something starting to approximate towards human thought inside them. And, and after all, if you read, you know, as David Bentley Hart has argued, if you read this the other way around, reductively, you always have to land up denying the reality of certain things. So I think increasingly philosophers think it makes much more sense um, to read it um, top downwards, if you, if you like. But, but, but it does mean there's a converse sort of naturalism going on where one more and more thinks that thought itself it, it is a kind of affection. It's a kind of, it's a kind of responding to things and then appropriating it for yourself. Um, and then you, you only sort of, every reality only kind of completes itself by a kind of act of praise of God, as the heretic Samuel Butler surprisingly puts it. Um, and I really, I think I, I really like that way of, of, of looking at things. It seems to be a natural way of looking at things. And also Rosmini uh, fascinatingly says that um, things position other things and things are only named from outside. So if you like, part of the answer to the aporia that a, a thing is always going outside itself to be a thing, is, is that a third is affirming it, unless other people were affirming your integral reality or unless all things were affirming the reality of other things. So this is a bit like, you know, the role of the Holy Spirit. And I absolutely agree with Julia. And I tried to stress in my paper that I think the, the problem about, you know, why the Holy Spirit is easily resolved in the sense that, um, there has to be a third for there to be an image because, you know, it, an image goes out from a thing into a third space. If there was no third space, it would just not, it would collapse back. So, so you can only think uh, the fact that there's a logos in God triadically, I, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, there's a question there and then another mm. uh, in the back over there. Yes, hello. Um, I'm interested in, the, in um, the sense of relation within the Trinity. So my, my question is for uh, Julian Maspero. Um, when you speak of, of relational ontology, does this entail that within the Trinity there are three seats of consciousness um, having a personal relationship to each other? And by, by seat of consciousness, I mean... 
that there is uh, a true statement that goes, I'm the Father, but not the Son, or I'm the Son, but not the Holy Spirit. I think that's a, a quick question about the, the Trinitarian understanding of God. Is there one set of consciousness of God or three seats? Thanks for the very interesting question. So I think that there is a, a not in the Trinity, because I'm the Father, I'm not the Son. This is not a logical not. Uh, this is not an ontologic, ontological not, because otherwise you, we had some, somehow nothingness into, into God. So also from the perspective of John, in Plato, we had this, uh, Plato was incredible, he was a genius, so he, he could see many things, and the, he saw this not. The point is that without incarnation, without revelation, he couldn't see this not as a relational not, but had to accept that he was a logical not, because mm. in, in Plato, being and, and um, intelligible do coincide. So everything that, is, that be, that exists, mm. is uh, intelligible in, in, in per se. On the contrary, with the gap, everything changes, because everything that be is intelligible f within God for the Logos, not for us, because there is this infinite distance, there is apophatism in the Cappadocian sense. So we are speaking of a relation that is mysterious for us, because we cannot perceive uh, this pure relational difference. Always we have a substantial difference. To be a subject means that you are a consciousness, you are separated from the other, and that was Descartes somehow. Descartes went in that direction. And the subject discovered through revelation, through Trinitarian ontology, closed in himself. And that was, that generate, generated the problems of, of modernity somehow. And we got this close ratio that cannot interact with other ratios. Now we have different logoi mm. which cannot speak to each other. So the university now is, is dying. I'm sorry for mm -hmm. saying that so clearly. But we have science, <laughs> physics, chemistry, with the philosophy, and they have nothing. They, their languages don't overlap anymore. So it's not a universe. It's a, a multiversity, not a university. But we are losing the, the core of what we did. To get there, you need somehow relations. So okay. a kind of difference that is the, the very reason that differentiate is what joins. And this is not through logic. It's neither through being not being differences, mm. but is a relational difference that we can somehow guess or experience through feeling because we have that in, within us. Okay. This is another level, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 I, I just wanted to add that I, I think even in the case of God, it's, it's not that sort of relation is sort of displacing substance or hypostasis, but it's in a kind of balance with it. And one of the problems that in reading Augustine and Aquinas is that although they talk about substantive relations, they don't quite identify the persons with the relations. And I think that's because, you know, if you have relations with no poles, they, they, they stop being relations. They become substances. And my own suggestion to resolve this problem, because, you know, every time you take the person outside the relation, it's identical with the essence, and yet the essence is repeated twice, is that I think only motion or kinesis in some eminent sense resolves this. So it, it's because it's not static. It's because there's a constant, if you like, renewal of the paternal monarchia through the response of the spirit to the sun. That, that there's this constant kinetic sort of renewal of, of, the, of that kind of independent moment, even though it immediately passes into something related. So you need the dynamism, I think, to understand why the sort of the, the hypostases and uh, the scases are in balance. Yeah. There's a question over there in the back. Hello, um, Emily Kempson, University of Cambridge. Thank you all for your stimulating papers. My question is for John Milbank. I was taken by what you were saying about how God is apophatic and we can't get our head around God. And similarly, all of creation is mm -hmm. apophatic and we can't get our head around creation. 
classically when we talk about God being a particular way and creation being that way as well, as, as you of course well know, there's also a great difference in how those things exist mm. between the two. So my, my first question is how is creation, the apophaticism of creation different from the apophaticism of God? My second question, yeah. which is related to it, is, you, is what happens to the logos and connectedly logic in your understanding? You what happens to, to what? The to, to the logos and connectedly logic in logic. your understanding. Okay. Because you've talked about how it all comes down to feeling and yeah. we can't think about the world and, and yeah. you know, it's logical, the law of non-contradiction yeah. is gone. Classically also, yeah. there's a strong connection between the logos and the order of the world and the intelligibility yeah. of it. So where does that happen? Yeah. Has that been jettisoned or is there still a place for it alongside yeah. feeling? No, I mean, to take the second question first, I mean, not at all. The order is completely ineffable, you know, but it's something much more like um, a musical order where um, there are separate notes and yet you can't think of them as notes unless you see that they're linked, where you only hear things one by one, but you have to hear it as a whole phrase. And it, 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 it's, deeply, it's a deeply paradoxical sense of order. So the sense of order in which we rejoice is, you know, not the kind of uh, order that one sees in sort of um, books of formal logic, even though that has its place, but it's a regional place. So I think that by now, philosophers like Graham Priest have ably shown that, you know, to, to say that there's a point where the law of non-contradiction breaks down doesn't mean that anything goes because um, it's only a regional explosion. It still leaves all ordinary logic and all the purposes it serves and its degree of truth totally in place. It just ceases to be true at the point where you engage the infinite or an infinite regress or the relationship of the finite to the infinite. And as already people like Bradley have shown, uh, the ordinary world involves these kind of infinite regresses. And people like Cusa had already seen this. In relation to the first question, I could approach it this way, that I think when one's thinking about the meta sort of imminent metaphysical structures, you always run up against you know, problems like the following, sort of, is everything um, a kind of flux of process? or is there kind of an absolute integrity to individual things? But if, if you have a kind of metaphysics of isolation, then that doesn't really make sense. How are there all these isolated realities? And on the other hand, if you're just saying everything is process and flux, why are there these stopping points? Why, you know, why, why are the, the predilections of things to form certain realities? And this is just what, Whitehead is dealing with, albeit he comes up with a rather too kind of pagan and dualistic solution that there's flux on the one hand and the world of sort of the potentials of the ideas or what he calls the eternal objects on the other hand. If, if you do, now, if you don't have a dualistic solution, you can say, well, the reason why an imminent ontology doesn't work is that neither process nor substance are absolute and final. They both derive from God. And yet then there's a twist in the story because you're, you're not saying, oh well, it, therefore in God all that dissolves, you know, we're, we're just into a one, an ineffable one. Lo and behold, Trinitarian <laughs> theology seems to say those problems are still there in God. There are still those aporetic tensions. There's motion and yet there's hypostasis and, 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 and relation. But, but, but uh, uh, you know, somehow they're infinitely resolved in a way that we can't understand. So it, 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 at that point, you don't sort of explode the problems of this world. You don't leave this world, the horizontal, behind. On the contrary, you stay with this world, and, and you, stay that the mis you say that the mysteries of this world are disclosing the mysteries at the heart of God. And ultimately, they can only be lived out, celebrated in liturgy, in life, association, um, you know, realized when we mend the world through politics and so on. This is why inv I invoke the perspective of somebody like Comenius, which seems to be already all about, more about making and remaking than a merely medieval vision.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. We now must uh, stop and uh, we conclude this uh, session, the first session of the conference. We thank very much our uh, speaker of this morning. And uh, now there is the coffee break and we will uh, uh, begin again at 11.15. Uh, right. Okay, thank you. No, thank you, Trudeau. Thank you so much for...